Everyone, thanks for joining us today for the Rust in the Cloud panel discussion at the Cloud Native Rust Day. I'm your moderator, William Morgan. I'm joined by a panel of illustrious, illustrious Rust experts. Um, and I would, at this point, like to ask them to introduce themselves uh, going from left to right in alphabetical order by first name. Nice. I think that means I'm first. My name is Ashley Williams. I'm currently the interim executive director at the Rust Foundation. I'm also a member of the Rust core team and have participated in almost, it feels like all the Rust teams at some point. Um, but for, I guess, the purposes of this panel, I, uh, <laughs> I used to work at Cloudflare um, and am very interested in WebAssembly and serverless. <laughs> Carl? Yeah, and I'm Carl Lurch. I'm a principal engineer at Amazon Web Services, and I work on Tokyo uh, in asynchronous runtime for the Rust programming language. Paul, or uh, Oliver, sorry. Ah, it's fine. Um, I'm Oliver Gould. I'm the CTO at a company called Buoyant, um, where we work mostly, at, where I work mostly on Linkerd, which is a CNCF project that we created about five years ago now. Um, and this for in, this version of it, uh, Linkerd2, is heavily built on a Rust proxy. And so we've been really focused on the Rust Tokyo ecosystem uh, heavily over the past three to five years. Um, yeah. How about you, Paul? Sure, yeah, uh, I'm Paul Howard, um, Principal Systems Solutions Architect uh, with ARM. I work in the ARM Architecture and Technology Group uh, I lead a small engineering team here at ARM where we are contributing into the Parsec project. And Parsec is a uh, Rust-based security-focused project that is now uh, part of the CNCF. It's been a CNCF sandbox project uh, since last year. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. And I'm William Morgan. I'm the CEO of Buoyant. So I work closely with Oliver. Uh, I have never written a line of Rust in my life, so I am pure still pure and, and beautiful. Uh, so I will uh, constrain myself in this presentation to asking questions. Um, should we do a quick question number one, should we do a quick vote based on these profile images of who is most likely to end up in prison due to their Rust related code? I'm gonna go with that. What? <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke because everyone looks uh, excited like... and happy except for Oliver who looks kind of very frightening. Well, you chose the pictures, so. Yeah. Yeah. I took I took the <laughs> latest Twitter images for each person. Okay. Well, that's a dangerous game. Wow, all right. <laughs> we'll I do feel another like I dodged a bullet end. there, okay. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the discussion, we'll do another vote and see how results have changed. Okay, so the first question that I bring uh, before you, illustrious panelists, is uh, the, the topic of this panel is Rust in the Cloud. So what have you been working on in this area and what have you learned? And Ashley, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so what I am actively working on is probably slightly different uh, than you might mean by this question, but I'll get to that. Um, so I guess, <laughs> The very first time that I got Rust uh, into the cloud in production was when I was working at NPM several years ago. And uh, my favorite quote from the CTO at the time, CJ Silverio, is, I like Rust because Rust is boring. Um, and uh, ultimately, that just means uh, we were getting woken up uh, by PagerDuty a lot less thanks to our Rust services. And, and that was really delightful. Uh, and it, it kind of goes against the, the general vibe of picking up technologies because they're exciting. Um, and, and so the boring quality has always been really fantastic. The thing that I'll say I've learned is that convincing folks to transition services to Rust, regardless of whether they're in the cloud or not, um, requires this transition of understanding when you invest time that on the face might sound very simple, but is actually kind of like a big culture shift. Uh, which is when you're writing things in Rust, you end up needing to invest a lot more time upfront uh, instead of, you know, you know, I'm working on a service uh, and then I put it into production and then it screams at me. Uh, with Rust, all of that screaming happens at the beginning. Uh, and getting used to that investment upfront instead of coming later um, can be really tricky when you're trying to transition a team. <laughs> awesome. Paul, how about you? 
Uh, yeah, so um, I, so I've mentioned the Parsec project. So I, I work on this Parsec project. Uh, Parsec is a software service, and it's it's providing uh, convenient abstractions and common APIs over hardware security for things like key storage and crypto. Um, so so it's really about building a cloud native and portable dev experience for security, um, more in more in the world of edge rather than necessarily in the cloud. Um, and I think actually workloads roaming from cloud to edge is, is one of the really uh, interesting areas um, for, for Rust as well. Now, I have to say, I chose Rust for Parsec. Um, I, I kind of was, was in the chair to make that call. Uh, and, and this was without ever having written a line of Rust code, right? Um, this, this was a, a couple of years ago. Um, I just felt really from what I knew about the language, what I'd read about the language and what I'd heard other people saying, um, it 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 felt like the way to intercept the future, right? It, it really felt like it was a, a language that was in exactly the right space um, for a security focused system level piece um, like, like Parsec. And two years down the line, I, I don't regret that decision at all, right? So, so what I've learned, well, I've learned a mixture of things. Um, one of the things I've learned is that the language is actually a lot more beautiful than it often gets credit for. Um, so all of the messaging you hear around Rust is it's focused on safety and on performance, both of which of course are, are absolutely core and critical to what this language is doing. Um, less tends to be said about the dev experience. And I, I think this is a shame. And in, in fact, when the dev experience is spoken of, it, it, it can be a little bit negative. Um, you know, it gets a reputation as having a steep learning curve and a high barrier to entry. These criticisms aren't entirely unfounded, but the language can be a beautiful language. It's very expressive. Its abstractions are concise syntactically, uh, as well as, as being low runtime cost as well. Um, now, I've, I, I still haven't become an expert Rust developer as yet, right? I, I'm still working on that. I can't lay claim to that. Um, but what I have seen so far is that you can write code that is as elegant as, a, as like a pure functional language, for instance, with things like pattern ma matching, lots of expressive power. And yet, you know all along that you're writing code that's going to give you, you know, performance parity with C or C++, but without the memory faults and the data races um, and, and so forth. So, you know, it, it's really the the best of all worlds in 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 that regard so so i i always speak up for the dev experience of rust um because i think it's a shame that the learning curve message gets in the way of um of, of what is actually a really elegant dev experience with this language hey very nicely put uh carl what have you been up to if anything what and what have i been up to um yeah i i mentioned Earlier, I work on uh, Tokyo, the um, an asynchronous runtime for Rust. So specifically, it, Tokyo lets you write network applications for Rust. Um, and it turns out, when you're in the cloud, there are networks that you have to factor in. There's, you know, shuffle bytes between one node, server, whatever, whatever they're contain called these days, containers, um, lambda func uh, functions, or whatever they whatever people do these days. I tend to stay, stay lower in the stack, so I'm trying to keep up. But um, before you, writing um, Rust, before I really got into Rust, I spent most of my time in the JVM, which is a great piece of technology. You know, Lots of really solid software is written with Java and other JVM languages um, in the cloud too. Uh, but what I was finding is like some of what some of what Java and the JVM gives you, like the garbage collector, which makes some things really easy, uh, can impact your the runtime characteristics of the program that you're writing. Like especially like what the garbage collector runs, stop the world, pause requests, and that can call, like result in tail latencies to spike. And when working like with microservices, when you have lots of different services talking to each other that the tail latencies will result in um, like will will be will impact like the end application because you're talking to you're fanning out lots of requests if one request is slow it's going to impact the entire like ensemble of requests so rust offers 
um, a solution to that by having a runtime less language. And you can really get really like con control tight, low resource um, services. So you're, you're paying less, like you're building services in the cloud, you're paying less, you're using less memory, your requests respond faster, more controlled, more reliable. Um, and that's really attractive to a lot of people building, you know, products, uh, software in the cloud. So like I think um, Paul hinted at that learning curve, I think part of that's not, I mean, there's the language aspect and it's, you know, it's improving all the time, but there's also the aspect of like Rust really is still a new language and the ecosystem is young compared to, you know, platforms like Java or Go that have matured a lot over the years. So what I'm trying to do um, these days is improve like the tooling, especially around debugging and like build up more of that higher level, like tangential infrastructure around building services. So I think, um, and I'm on a team at Amazon, um, Rust platform team that were like Nico Matsakis and Felix um, and a few other Rust developers that work out in the open um, are on this team and we're working kind of on the open source infrastructure. So Nico started with the async vision doc, um, which you can probably Google on the, it's on the Rust blog, but kind of solicitating experience from people building um, services with Rust to kind of see, to learn what is missing. So we're doing that. And then step two, hopefully we'll be fixing some of that. Great. Okay, Oliver, how about you? What have you been working on in Rust and the cloud? Uh, th th those were both, or all three were kind of great setups for my experience um, working on cloud infrastructure. So when we got started with Point and Linkerd, um, this is about 2015, the cloud ecosystem actually looked quite differently than it does today, especially when we talk about cloud native. Um, we we're much more focused on things like Mesos, which is kind of a predecessor to Kubernetes. And that mob, that ecosystem in general was very JVM heavy, right? And so um, Mesos itself, lots of the schedulers were written in the JVM. Um, and as we started working on the first version of Linkerd, we were coming from um, Twitter's ecosystem, which was heavily JVM and Scala centric. And so what we got in that ecosystem was uh, great functional primitives, uh, type safety, and a really kind of mature runtime. So the JVM comes with plugins and monitoring tools and all sorts of uh, bells and whistles that folks have experienced running in production. Uh, and then shifting forward a few years, we really saw Kubernetes and that model of microservices um, and that operational model really take root in, in the cloud ecosystem. And so in that world, we we where we were running Linkerd as this kind of very large proxy per node, we want to have now basically a proxy per process or a proxy per pod, right? A group of processes. Um, and that transition really made us look to uh, something with a native runtime, something that was going to compile down to, to be a, as fast and efficient as C. And so at the time, I think Rust was far in the lead. And now there's things like Swift, which are kind of in a similar space. But um, it, especially as, as when we talk about the, the, kind of the type system and the types of primitives that you can actually build composable primitives, uh, Rust was really, really uh, hit that sweet spot. Um, and, and so as we've moved into this, I think the things that Carl was talking about of having kind of the operational tooling, where that ecosystem isn't quite as mature um, as it is going to need to be, but really seeing the trajectory of the ecosystem going. So when we started, there, there were, you know, we had Hyper, but there was no HTTP2, uh, let alone HTTP3 or anything kind of fancy like that. I mean, really seeing the set of primitives in the ecosystem blossom over the past three years. So things like Tonic and Tower uh, really, really um, make me think that like it's time for us <laughs> in, a, in a much more serious way. And I, I think that'll be the theme of what we're gonna talk about today is that really the, the kind of maturity point for the ecosystem is really hitting a place where people can be really productive without having to invest in low level primitives in the way that we've had to over the past several years. So uh, I am super stoked for, for where we're going. Um, and it really does feel like, you know, two years ago telling people to like start going to production with Rust, you're gonna throw them into kind of like a, 
a box of tools that they're going to have to go put together. And, and now we're getting to a place where there's a lot more ready-made patterns in the ecosystem um, to set you up for products. Great. OK. Um, so you know that was a pretty, that was an easy open-ended question. I actually want to ask something that is a lot harder um, for this next one, which is, you know, it's it's there's lots of nice things to say about Rust in a variety of contexts, but is there something that makes Rust, you know, whether it's a language or the ecosystem or the community um, or or any aspect of Rust, something that makes it a particularly good fit for the constraints of the cloud, you know, which is this very particular environment, you know, that that is uh, quite different from other kind of execution environments out there. Let me just insert my my one take on this first, um, since I'm already talking. Uh, <laughs> the um, I really think the union of um, like cl cloud is necessarily networked, right? It's about a dynamic system where things are going to communicate over a network, uh, and to do network software in any reasonable way, you need safety guarantees, especially memory safety, right? Um, if we look back over the past decade, anything that's network focused that's written in C is an attack vector. And so having that kind of the joint, the union of like networking primitives and memory safety are really kind of the critical, uh, the killer app for, for why REST is going to be a cloud native technology, in my opinion. I think you can, I mean, I'm going to go off on a tangent, but it is possible to write safe C, like correct C. It just takes like an amount of resources and, and energy that um, most organizations won't even be able to afford to put in. Like, I mean, like um, S2N, like Amazon's um, TLS implementation is C, but the amount of like, they go in and formally prove it. They use like they use theorem provers, they go and uh, like audits, they use fuzzers, they use, like very limit and like very well constrained um, like code. It's just, but that is a lot of effort that most would not even do. And I don't even, even at Amazon, we'd rather not put in that effort if we don't have to, which is why um, we're using Rust heavily. And it's also why before Rust, um, people, uh, people would use the JV, like JVM based language. So what makes it a good fit for the cloud? It's, um, well, not having to worry about that safety side of things. So that's a mental burden you can take off of your head, but then run leaner, right? It's less memory, less CPU, it'll cost less. Um, it'll be better for the environment. You know, when you're, if you're talking about huge scale, that will have a impact, less carbon emission. I'm just gonna throw that in. Um, but, and, and as, as the ecosystem improves, it's going to be a good experience. I think it's not there yet, but we're gonna get there. Like it's there, I mean, there is a lot that's good now, but we're, I think in a few years, it's going to be pretty stellar, I hope. Paul, does that jive with your experience at Parsec? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, this, this is a really interesting question. That what about Rust makes it particularly a good fit for the cloud? I, Parsec is more of an edge compute um, project. But I, I, I think what I'd say in response to this question is, um, well, m maybe two things. The first thing I'd say is what makes it good for the cloud is the same as what makes it good for anything else, right? It, it, it just gives you... You know, fast, fast execution, great performance characteristics, uh, low, low memory footprint, and with all of those uh, safety and security guarantees built in as well. I mean, when, when, when would you not want that, whether you're, you're in the cloud or, or indeed anywhere else? Um, but I, I think its particular opportunities to shine in the cloud come in like the software defined infrastructure pieces, right? The pieces of your cloud orchestration that you need to just stay out of the way, but do everything perfectly. You know, um, Rust, Rust compiles down to very, very small, low, low footprint binaries. It, it, it's absolutely perfect for your software defined networking, for your service mesh layers, um, for, for, your, for your tenant separation primitives, you know, the, 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 frame, the skeletal frameworks in your deployment that keep workloads isolated from each other. Uh, I mean, look, what well, Linkerd, right, is a, a, a great example. Um, look at look at like micro VM technologies, right? Think, things like Firecracker, uh, AWS Firecracker is is a hypervisor written in Rust. Um, 
I, I think that that kind of thing where you want you you want software defined infrastructure that shrinks out of the way of the the workloads that you're running. That's not to say your workloads might not be Rust as well, right? Um, but but I think but I think for that soft that those software defined infrastructure pieces, those thin pieces that just need to slide in, um, and you know, so, you know se separating the workloads from the hardware, separating the workloads from each other. Um, I, I think that that's that's an area where Rust really has the opportunity to shine, um, because security is just so so critical uh, in those areas, right? And, and um, in Rust, Rust, you you get you get so much of that, uh, not not for free, but I think it's exactly what Ashley was saying, right? You invest you invest at the right time, right? Rust is Rust, Rust is major left shifting. Um, you, you know, you you pay you pay all of that pain to get your code compiling. Uh, and there, but but then after that, you're happy, right? That that shouldn't be something we complain about. That should be something we celebrate. Yeah, yeah. Like I hear some from some users of Tokyo, they're like, they don't necessarily need the raw performance, but they're able to not worry about it. Like so, it's they're like they're start, like, why would you want to spend all that time up front? It's it's when you get like you, over time, it gets less time. But also, like a startup doesn't have to worry about performance. For example, I mean within some boundary. I hear from like fly.io, they're like, we've, like, we've never optimized. It's just, it's within our target. But, and also not just um, long lived infrastructure, but I think you hinted at that, Paul, but um, like startup times, like if you have bits of you know, cloud functions that run occasionally, um, something like, like, like Rust will let you write your functions to with very, very short boot up time. So you don't have to keep them hot or when they are um, being called occasionally, you don't have that startup cost associated with it, that time that boot up a VM. This is also where WASM comes into it as a really- Well, yeah, I was about to say like, we've been getting extremely close to saying the W word, um, but I, I do think like when we say, is there something about Rust that makes it particularly a good fit for the cloud? Like I, I really do agree with John that like, I think Rust is a good fit for the cloud, like the same way it's a good fit for a lot of different problems, like the cloud, perhaps this is blasphemous to say, but I don't necessarily think that the the needs the cloud has are particularly unique to many software projects. Um, and so like the reliability and the efficiency, but I think talking about why Rust is well suited to WebAssembly, a lot of people talked about WebAssembly, like particularly when it first showed up as like, oh, it's like our multi-language future. Um, and then inevitably people very quickly realized that compiling any language to WebAssembly was not really gonna be a great great situation. Uh, as somebody who has worked on many projects of compiling all sorts of different languages to WebAssembly, um, it's, it's, it's a much harder problem and the efficiency gains that you might get from something like it can disappear sometimes if you're particularly trying to take a GC language and put it into WebAssembly. But Rust uh, benefits uh, from its very, very low runtime cost. And I, I've been shamed by C programmers to, when I say that Rust has a no runtime, because um, they, oh, I won't get into it, but I'll say extremely low runtime cost. Um, but I, I think the other thing that makes Rust really well suited for WebAssembly, which goes back to a point that a lot of folks have touched on here, but not said explicitly, is Rust learning experience is tough, and that's an element of developer experience, but Rust tooling is top notch. And when you're talking about compiling things, having a good tool chain is super important. And so other languages that I think are well suited to WebAssembly, just they don't have as friendly of tooling as Rust has. Um, and that makes Rust particularly well suited for that space. And I mean, with WebAssembly, it's like, low level system plus containers. Um, I don't think we've seen the future of WebAssembly yet, but my favorite thing about it is that uh, we, in theory it was developed to like replace Flash and browsers, but it is becoming a tool of the cloud, probably exclusively before it ends up actually showing up in anybody's client. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a great uh, segue into the next question because you used the word future. So we've <laughs> talked, you know, so far about kind of the state of uh, uh, where Rust is today, 
and uh, developer uh, experience versus tooling and, and so on. If we fast forward for, uh, I picked a limited horizon, just five years from now, um, you know, how will we see Rust used in cloud environments, especially Ashley, it seems like this question is well, uh, tailor-made I for wanted, you. Well, I want to weigh in on one thing because you say limited scope five years from now. <laughs> if we take a second and think about what a, like network programming looked like in Rust five years ago, um, oh my goodness, five years is a really, really long time. And I see no reason to believe that the epic amount of progress that was made um, in the last five years will not be the type, I mean, we'll, we're gonna see that if not more, I think particularly uh, in cloud application space for Rust. Uh, and, and I think what I would say just kind of probably to tee it off for everybody else is, so we recently announced the Rust Foundation, or I guess in February, which feels like it was yesterday, but I don't know, what is time? Uh, but uh, our founding sponsors are some of the biggest clouds on the planet. Uh, and one of the things that's particularly exciting to me about all of them is that they are all interested not only in using Rust, but also working on and contributing to Rust itself. And so um, I, <laughs> I think the future is gonna be very, very interesting. Uh, and I'm really, really excited about it. But it'd probably be easier to predict like a couple months from now than five years, because I think yeah. a lot of things are going to change. <laughs> yeah. Well, the flip side is I hope I think Russ is, has had five years of like like extremely fast like evolution and growth and churn and figuring out what it's all about. Um, and I think the next five years are going to be a lot more stable. So it will be less evolution like of Rust and more growth like. I guess Rust is probably in its teenage years. Like it's it's going to finally like you know start fitting. Like kind of like the tooling will start getting more refined. It's going to be more about filling in the gaps and um, polishing off edges. And I don't know. I did a lot of evolving in my twenties, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> but, but the foundation's there, right? The, yeah, the, 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 the foundation right. is there. No pun intended. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Uh, but so there, there is going to be change, but I hope it's not going to be like groundbreaking change. I think it'll, I think we'll see more of the same. I mean, if they're like WASM, I think WASM is probably going to be where there's the most discovery. Um, because I mean, the whole ecosystem is still figuring out like what it is about and where the applications are. Um, it's not my area of expertise, so I will let Ashley. It's a technology with an there. identity yeah. crisis. It knows yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Besides like in the networking space and the cloud, uh, like I think it's just gonna be more like, we'll see more um, application of it as as that learning curve and as more people learn it. And as we polish off that beginning, like getting started experience that like debugging experience that like uh, tooling experience, I think more, we'll, we'll see more um, Rust use in places, you know, in places we might not initially expect it, but um, not necessarily new groundbreaking um, areas, more just some new, new field, new experiences, uh, new development in existing spaces. Something that I've noticed about my interactions with the Rust community is that the community really skews young, right? Or I see a lot of folks either in college or coming out of college. And like when I was in college, if you wanted to be a systems programmer, you were going to learn C or C++. And like that was you know, not a really welcoming job opportunity or career path there. And, and I see now lots of younger people who are coming into the industry really enthused about Rust and, and kind of really engaged at the systems level in a way that was just not there 10 plus years ago, from my perspective, at least. And so I, I do think that there's going to be uh, an... an uh, I don't want to say the word army, but a, a big kind of contingent of uh, of Rust developers coming into the industry in the next couple of years. And, and there, yeah, a big a herd of crustaceans coming into the um, into the community or into the industry. And I think that's really going to drive a tidal shift in terms of like the quality of infrastructure. And, and you know, I, I I don't know what it's going to look like, but I, I know that it's going to be wild and exciting. Okay. And you, I mean, you touched on something that I don't think we mentioned much, but Rust 
makes systems level programming approachable. Like the fact that you can go and write at that level and not worry about um, the, the sharp edges of C or C++ is very empowering. And it's gonna be like, it's gonna be interesting to see as more um, developers get to that level, what are we going to build? Like, it's just like, you know, all the advantages of having more <laughs> minds on it, right? So that will it's be- It's my favorite part of Rust. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. So you know, our audience probably like me is still in their uh, Rust infancy. Uh, so what is the best way for people who are not currently, you know, in, in doing anything with Rust to get involved uh, with Rust, in, both in general, but also you know, since this, the topic is cloud native Rust or cloud related Rust efforts. And Paul, why don't we kick it off with you? Um. Yeah, sure. That, that, yeah, inter interesting question. Um, uh, what one obvious way I, I think is to just go seek out the growing number um, of, of Rust-based open source projects that are out there. Um, you know, but both both in CNCF uh, and and elsewhere. Um, I'm biased, of course. Parsec is one example. Um, you can you can go and learn about that if you're interested in 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 platform agnostic security. Um, but but the num the, the number of projects is growing, uh, and you know Rust is uh, the, the, these these projects are, are crying out for people to come and learn the language um, and and get involved um, because the number of Rust developers out there, you know, it's it's growing, but it's not big enough yet. We'd like it to be bigger. Um, so so yeah, I, I think just just go and go and see what's out there would be one of my uh, calls to action, and, and it. it so it goes back to the previous question as well, because I, you know, I think usage is definitely going to grow. Uh, Ashley already mentioned the Rust Foundation. I think the Rust Foundation uh, is a is a, a great step forward. You know, this this independent stewardship stewardship of the language, um, not to mention the the adoption by the uh, the, the major sort of um, uh, the, the major hyperscale cloud players um, as well. So, uh, so so yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I have anything better to say other than to just go go find the go find the open source projects that are out there and uh, and, and find a way to get stuck in. Oliver, does that make sense to you from the perspective of Linkerd? Yeah, I mean, for what, what where we've seen successes, you know, if you're a student, Summer of Code is a great, or or some of these kind of paid internships are great ways to get involved in open source. And I, I think definitely my strong advice is to go through the open source, trying to, um, you know, there, there's where you can read the most code and learn the most. And, and there's usually, like, if you go to the um, Tokyo Discord, for instance, it's like, packed full of people talking about 30 different projects. And there's, you know, if you're interested there, you can just soak up a lot of information just by watching. Um, yeah, I, I think the Cloud Native Computing Foundation hosts now, I think three or four Rust projects, if not more. And so there's entries there. Uh, they do some of our code projects every year. Um, there's things like uh, Crustlet, which is, uh, if you're interested in Kubernetes, is a way to, use I think I think it's the intersection of Wasm and Rust and Kublet, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, the name makes me laugh every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean like I, I I mean I don't know. The way I got into any of this stuff is like find the thing that you want to spend time on. And if you find a project that you actually want to spend time on, you'll get good and you'll get involved in it. And you know that usually will lead to something good, hopefully. One thing I worry about, you know, because I do know a little bit about uh, Linkerd is that uh, I think Linkerd could be a hard project to get started with. You know, it's like advanced Rust, and, and Parsec may have some elements of that too. Are those are those actually good starting points? Well, yeah, to get re just get your feet wet, like in the Tokyo um, GitHub, we have Mini Redis, which is a kind of educational um, project that's trying to have a larger real. Um, so, like piece of software that you can um, read. It's well commented and it's also the foundation of the Tokyo guide. So one, like if it's just to get your feet wet, you can go and like try to add a new, implement a new Redis command because there's a com Redis command for everything, which is 
one reason why I was like, let's do mini Redis. Like any, any educational topic we can find a Redis command to mo model it. But um, besides well, that, like- I was gonna say, before you jump from <laughs> yeah. that, I wanna give Carl a shout out because when I was running uh, the developer experience team for Cloudflare workers, uh, we were writing some of our tooling in Rust and they were trying to kind of struggling through, uh, you know, learning Tokyo and stuff, not to critique Tokyo anyway, just as we've, I think all said, yeah. like, it's a little hard. Um, this mini Redis project was just kicking off and Carl actually worked with one of my new engineers um, to do a little bit of stuff on that. And it was huge for him uh, just learning how to navigate Tokyo and is now considered yeah. the Tokyo expert on like, the Rust <laughs> teams he works on. Um, so that was a really awesome experience. It was good to hear, thanks. And every time I've tried, had to like, I've had to learn async, I've, you know, Rust has evolved a lot in the last couple of years and I've had to like learn async await or learn rat wasm. And the way I learn these things is to write little toy programs. Like it doesn't have to be a, a top line, you know, project on crates that I owe to be uh, a good project to work on. So I, I try to find little toy <laughs> projects or tools to write for myself to, to yeah. learn things. Is and, the, yeah. and yeah, and I think the biggest like air missing gap, again, for me, it's, tooling and like little like just writing a little tool to do a little small thing that can help like the the build debugging or the like experience around building things like you're probably gonna try it out hit friction build a little tool to help it make it better and that will like there's a big need for that too Great. Uh, I would also just shout out very quickly that um, while they are by no means perfect, uh, if you're interested in learning Rust, we have the Rust book. And then uh, when we did the 2018 edition back in 2018, we had kicked off what we called these domain working groups, and they were able to um, write these kind of intermediate level books. So it's like, oh, you know Rust, but now you like want to do something with Rust. Like, where do I go after that book? Um, and there's a book uh, we call the async book that's about networking. Um, there's also a WebAssembly one. So I, it, it can often be the trap, and I'm a huge fan of this, that like in order to get involved uh, with open source, you end up having to contribute to open source, but that can be a super heavy lift for folks. Um, you can also just build a wacky project. Like the, the WebAssembly book, for example, has you build Conway's Game of Life, which honestly continues to be one of my favorite little projects. I don't know, you can do, we've seen really cool like artsy variants on it that are just super awesome. Um, but yeah, you can also just feel free, like when I wrote the original Rust bridge curriculum, um, we, we wrote a program that's like a simple website that will randomly give you a compliment every time you refresh it. So just coming up with like a project that's fun, I think is really the best. Don't feel like you have to, you know, necessarily like fix a bug in Tokyo as your first step. Um, it's super, it's super chill. And in fact, the Rust the Rust ecosystem is really excited for people building small projects in Rust. Yeah. And so tweeting about it and like there's a huge community. Um, yeah. Just do and something he, you think is fun. You know, <laughs> yeah. And even like get like the easy, sometimes the easiest way to get involved is submit a PR that just fixes a typo. Like we love, like I, we love those. And like oftentimes we'll see people come like, I don't know, it's just a typo. It's like, no, just like a one character PR is great. Just first to get involved, just open line of communication, start talking to people. Or asking questions about the docs is even usually a really good signal. Just like, I don't understand this, explain this to me. It can really help mm -hmm. develop the docs for projects. All right, so we're coming up on time. So we're gonna wrap it up with our, you know, final open-ended question uh, from each of you, which is if you could have embed one take home message in the brains of our audience members, what would that be? Uh, and then let's do let's do the opposite order from what we did in the first question. So let's start with you, Oliver. So uh, every time I've talked about um, Linkerd's proxy over the past few KubeCons and things like that, I, I ask people to raise their hands if they tried Rust, and like a couple hands go up, and I say like, well, wait two years, all your hands will be up. And then last year there's like a little bit more, but I, I really think that. Um, now is the time to start playing with Rust. It, it's ready for you. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities to still get involved and build cool things. It's not like a finished ecosystem, um, but it is a lot more welcoming than it was a few years ago. So uh, if systems programming is something that interests you, uh, please 
come get involved, talk to any of the communities uh, for the folks here or other rest projects. It's a very welcoming space. Carl, how about you? Um, well, I think um, Russ is not the best tool for every single job in programming. I'm not going to say that, but I think the span of use cases that it can be really good for is going is larger than some people might think. So we say systems programming a lot, um, but even like maybe even a web application like that might be a good fit because of how like built like I've seen people like rewrite Python. Um, like a Python web app to Rust and they say like they reduce their infrastructure cost by like 10x. So they, it's like Rust is getting easier to use. It's gonna like, it's there's still improvements to be made but every, you know, month we're pushing out fixes and improvements and give it a shot now. Um, if it see if you hit off, off something like let us know because we can't fix things that we don't know. Um, but yeah, like now I, now is the best time it's ever been to try Rust. Love it. Paul, how about you? Um, yeah, I, I think, I, well, for a start, I agree with, with, with all of that. Uh, the other thing I'd say, I guess, is I, I'd echo what I said um, right at the start. Uh, don't, don't think of the, the learning curve into Rust as, as pure overhead, right? It, it's exactly as Ashley was saying. It's, it's, it's investment in the right place. Um, you know, don't don't worry about fighting the. You you should celebrate fighting the borrow checker, not, not uh, don't be put off by fighting the borrow checker. It's um, you know, you're you're you, you're going through the pain at the right time and and saving yourself um, a, a, a lot uh, in, in the long run. Um, and it's a beautiful language as well. I have to keep plugging for that because it, it does that that message does get lost in in amongst all of the um, all of the other messaging around Rust. In, in, you know, incredibly, um, incredibly expressively powerful, um, and and, uh, and very beautiful once you're into it. Very nice, Ashley. You want to close this out? Uh, yeah. So it says, "What's my take-home message?" But I might uh, reach for some words from from Julia Evans, also known as Bork online. She does a lot of great zines, particularly around systems programming, and she did one about Rust. And what she said about Rust is that Rust makes improbable programs possible. Um, and then she also says that Rust makes her think, hey, maybe I could write that program. And I think there's two kind of messages of like hope and empowerment in there. One is, uh, you know, in the future, we're going to see more systems programmers. So if you're someone who never thought like you could be a systems programmer for any number of reasons, like Rust exists to try to convince you otherwise that it can help you do that. And that in addition, types of programs that we would otherwise think were not really possible. For example, I think about the parallelization effort of the CSS engine in uh, Firefox, for example, like literally tried to do it a ton of times and just like couldn't do it. And then they decided, oh, we should probably like write a new programming language to do this. We're like, wow, okay. Um, Rust made that possible. And so I think there's going to be new types of programs out there that are going to happen because of Rust. Uh, and we're going to have a lot more people uh, writing them. And I think that that's particularly exciting. And if you want to be a part of that, like Rust wants you to be there.